Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I'm a staff scientist at the Calus Visualization Core Laboratory. I'm also a certified instructor with software and data carpentry. Software and data carpentry are two global nonprofits whose goals are to teach foundational data science and comp scientific computing skills to um, students, uh, research staff, research faculty um, at universities around the world. And uh, we primarily teach these skills through short um, hands-on workshops of the kind that we've been doing this whole semester, including today. Today's workshop is going to continue the Introduction to Data Science uh, workshop series with an introduction to Git. So I will start sharing my screen now. Okay. So today, as I mentioned, today is going to be an introduction to version control with Git. Now, um, I'm going to give. I'm going to start with a little bit of just kind of like back, like some context uh, to um, like a motivational story that we're going to carry on throughout the day um, and use it as like a just a teaching example with Git. So we have two characters, Wolfman and Dracula, and they've been hired by a company that is a spinoff from uh, Euphoric State University to investigate the possibility of sending their next planetary lander to Mars. Now, they're going to need to collaborate on this project to create all the project files, and uh, they want to make sure that they can work on all of these files at the same time. Um, but in the past, when they've tried to do this, they've run into problems. So in the past, they've either had to take turns, so make sure that um, only one person is ever editing a single file, and then maybe they send an email to you know, their, their teammates and say, hey, I'm done editing you know, my first file, you know, now someone else can edit it, or things like this. Um, but that's really inefficient, because then you have people sitting around waiting for other people to finish working on files before they can themselves start working on them. Um, you may have encountered this in your own workflow. Anytime you catch yourself emailing um, copies of a Word document or something back and forth to one another, that's basically the same thing. You've got one collaborator who works on the Word document, then they change and uh, make their changes and save it and attach it in an email and send it back to some other collaborator who then opens it and makes their changes and so on and so forth. That's a very inefficient way to work because a lot of people are sitting around waiting for you know, one or other of their colleagues to finish. Um, so one of their colleagues says, hey, maybe we should use version control um, to manage your work. Version control is a lot better than mailing files back and forth. So just a couple of selling points here. So the version control techniques that I'm going to teach you today. So if you invest the time to learn them, it is very difficult, if not um, impossible, to lose work without work without doing something really uh, extreme. You have to work really, really hard to lose work if you're using version control properly. And as we'll see, with version control all of the old versions of files are saved. So it's always possible to go back in time and see exactly who made what changes when and why. Um, and because we have this record of all the changes, when they were made and who made them, we always know who to ask questions uh, later. If we find a change that we don't understand why somebody made it, we know exactly who made it. So we can email that person or walk to their office or schedule a meeting or something to talk about those, those changes. Um, and you can always revert to those changes at any particular point. So you can think of it as an unlimited undo button. If you're used to doing like a control Z and undoing the most recent change or doing it multiple times to go back through the changes, if you use version control properly, you have an unlimited undo button. Now, if you have several people, if you work, if you typically work on projects with multiple people, there's an extra feature to version control, which is that um, it will prevent uh, colleagues from accidentally overwriting someone else's changes. So if you have two different colleagues who both made changes to the same document and both try to save those changes, 
you will get something that's called a, a conflict. There will, the version control system will detect that there's a conflict between these two changes, and it may not be able to automate the conflict resolution process entirely, but it will at least let you know that, hey, there's a conflict here that you need to resolve with your team before these changes can be saved. Um, but that isn't to say that like teams are uh, the only uh, groups that benefit from version control. Even if you always work alone on, on your own projects, version control is extremely useful. So it, allow, it will allow you to have a nice, almost like a digital lab notebook for all of your work. And you can always go back and look at the work that you did and, and understand what changes were made if you're doing software development and you happen to um, break your code, it doesn't work anymore, you can always revert back to the most recent working version of the code and, and you know, start from there. Um, uh, version control uh, sits behind um, a lot of services that you use um, and don't even, and maybe, maybe you don't even know that version control is being used in the background, but it underpins an increasingly large number of the kind of the digital research services that um, that we use. Okay. Now, in terms of prerequisites, so we're going to be using Git today from the Unix shell from within uh, Jupyter Lab. Um, so there is some expectation that you have some experience with the the shell, although it's not entirely mandatory. Um, you know, I'll mention some um, shell commands uh, that we use. Uh, when we use them, or I'll try to, uh, and you can always ask a question if I use a command, uh, a shell command that um, that you're not familiar with. But if you came to the shell training a few weeks ago, then you will know all that you will need to know uh, in terms of prerequisites. Now, in terms of what we're going to cover today, um, so there's a link here to set up. So this will take you to set up instructions if you want to get a local install. Um, of Git. Um, so there's uh, not much in the way of setup, but I can't do a, such a large setup uh, local in, with local installs with so many people. But there's the link in case you want to do it yourself. So we're going to cover the first three episodes on you know what is version control, why you should use it, setting up Git, um, creating a repository, um, tracking changes. So these are uh, these are the, the the basics of how to use um, Git as a um, kind of content tracking content management system. Um, then we have exploring history and ignoring things are um, two uh, you know two slightly more advanced. Well, exploring history is a little bit more advanced um, than the ignoring things. Um, but then the second half focuses a lot on um, uh, on a collaboration with uh, larger groups of people via GitHub. So the first half, say like the first six episodes are going to be focused on using Git from within the terminal. And then the episodes maybe seven, eight, and nine are going to focus on uh, using GitHub and um, showing you how to create repositories on GitHub and how to um, take changes that you make on your local laptop or workstation and push them up to this repository on GitHub and how to pull changes down that maybe other collaborators have, have added to GitHub. So for seven, eight, and nine, uh, you will need to have a GitHub account. Uh, so if you haven't uh, gone over to GitHub and made an account, um, I'll remind you when we take our mid-afternoon break, that might be a good time to go and do that. Uh, and then depending on how much time we have, at the end of the day, we might talk a little bit about um, uh, best practices with open science and how version control relates to, to those practices. And then a little bit about licensing and citation and, and hosting, uh, kind of depending on what kind of questions you uh, you have. I mean, that, that material is material that you can easily read through, but if you have particular questions that you want to ask me about licensing your, uh, your software um, uh, that, you, that you write or how to make your work easier to cite or things like this, we can do that. And then um, 
we might talk about using Git from within Jupyter Lab. That would be kind of like the last topic that we would uh, we would cover um, if we have uh, if we have time. So, any questions about the kind of schedule of events for the rest of the afternoon? Um, so, Hui, yes, I will share the video recording, uh, not via email. It'll be posted on YouTube, and I'll send the link around via email. Um, and then you can access it from our YouTube channel, probably tomorrow, um, but certainly by the end of the week. Okay. Okay. So if there's no more questions, then I'll just go ahead and, and get started. Okay. So automated version control. So in this short episode, I'm just going to go over what version control is and try to provide you a basic motivation for why you should use it. And hopefully you'll come away with an understanding of the, the basic benefits of an automated version control system like Git, um, and then have a basic understanding of how, uh, of how version control systems work. Okay. So we can start with this kind of... Um, motivating cartoon, uh, as it were, uh, from phdcomics.com. And so I think anybody who has, um, certainly anybody who has done a, um, a long paper where they have to work closely with a, uh, a teacher or supervisor, you know, if you're a master's student and you write your master's thesis, then you will uh, experience this or some version of this. Or, um, or certainly if you're a PhD student and you're writing your PhD dissertation, then um, you will also experience some, some version of this. The, the basic idea where, you know, you write up what you think is a very polished draft that you would be happy to submit and be done with, and then you send it off to a colleague who then marks it up with changes and then emails it back to you. And then you, you try to incorporate their changes and then email those back. And then, you know, more changes are made and emailed back. And pretty soon you have, I don't know, eight, nine different versions of the document buried in some email thread where it's really hard to keep track of what changes were made when, why, you know, maybe the same revisions have been suggested multiple times, but they haven't been properly incorporated. And it's really hard to, to, to see because you lose a lot of the, um, the motivation behind, uh, behind why those changes were made. So the idea is that we want to avoid this. Um, we want to avoid getting into the situation where we're emailing documents back and forth and always constantly um, uh, having to, to make the same revisions over and over again um, or corrections on the revisions. There's a much more efficient way to work. And today I'm going to try to expose you to uh, the tools that you need to have a better workflow. Um, so the basic idea um, behind uh, version control systems is that we're going to start, version control systems are going to start with a base document. And then they're going to have a record of changes that are made at each step of the way. So if you hear on the left, you have your base document and then you maybe have some changes and you apply those changes to the base document and you get a new document. And then you have a new set of changes that get applied to the new base document and you get a new document. And at each point in time with a version control system, we will be taking a snapshot of the document as well as a collection of the changes. So it's the fact that we will be storing the changes separate from the snapshot of the document itself is what, which is what is the kind of the key idea that will allow you to kind of have this unlimited undo button. So that's important. The idea of, of storing the changes separately from the document itself. So this is going to allow us to apply different sets of changes if we wanted to, to the same underlying document or maybe changes in a different order if we wanted to reorder the changes. 
So, but we're going to keep documents and changes, store them separately. And the reason that this is useful is that this allows, um, allows potentially users to make uh, two different users to make different sets of changes and still arrive at a coherent document. So here, two people can edit this same document. And you know, if one person makes a revision to the middle line of the first paragraph and the other person adds, um, um, adds you know, a couple of extra lines of text at the end of the document, then these two sets of changes can be applied to the same base document to arrive at a new document. And those individuals could be working in parallel on the same document and you won't have to worry about any kind of um, conflicts basically occurring. However, if, um, and, and you, the reason that you don't get a conflict is that users are not editing the same part in the same document. Um, so as long as that happens, then ver our version control systems, or as long as that doesn't happen, as long as users are editing different, different parts of the same document, our version control system will be able to automate the process of applying those changes. And here's an example of what that would look like. Okay, now the version control system is going to keep track of these changes for us. So the idea is to automate this process as much as possible. We don't want to have to do a lot of things uh, manually. And the way that the version control system is going to organize uh, this information is in something that's called a commit. So as we'll see uh, when we start doing the hands-on section, when we create, um, when we create changes, and create sets of changes, we're then going to commit those changes. And the act of uh, committing is what combines the existing base document with these changes to produce a new base document. And then the whole set of these commits over time is gonna be stored in something called a repository. And the, each project typically has its own repository and there is machinery for keeping repositories in sync even if you know, you have a team of a dozen people who are all working on the same project and they each have their own copy of the repository and these, these individuals are spread, you know, all over the world. You know, Git and GitHub have tools to facilitate keeping everybody's um, uh, versions of the repository up to date and identifying any conflicts that need to be resolved should, um, should users create conflicts by say editing the same part of the same file. Now version control systems have been allowed for a long time, um, uh, at least since the early 80s. So some of the early ones were tools like RCS, CVS, Subversion. Uh, Subversion is still around. I don't know about the other two. Um, so modern uh, version control systems such as Git and Mercurial um, are distributed version control systems. And what I mean by this is that instead of having some central location, some a central repository that everybody has access to and edits the files, that would be like maybe like a Google uh, or um, sorry, like Microsoft SharePoint or, or Google Drive or something like that. that. Those would be examples of centralized document repositories where people could make uh, changes to the same document. Um, Git and Mercurial are distributed in that everybody on the team has their own copy of the repository of all the documents. And then there might be a, a central repository on a server like GitHub, which acts as a coordination mechanism, but ultimately everybody has their own local copy of the project documents. Okay. So any questions, uh, any basic questions before we move on and start uh, getting into the hands-on portion of, of today's workshop. Okay, cool. Well, we will just move right along then. Okay, so setting up Git. So 
In this section, or in this episode, rather, we're going to talk about how to set up Git. We're going to do some configuration, which you have to do for the very first time you use Git on a particular computer. And then we're going to talk about uh, different configuration files. So there'll be a notion of a global configuration file that will apply across all repositories that you will create on, a, on your computer. And then we'll talk about a local configuration file which is basically like a project or repository specific configuration file, which can be used to override uh, settings in the global configuration file. Okay. And for the hands-on portion of the workshop today, we're going to need our, our trusty cloud computing instances. So if you're joining from within Calst, it would be great if you could click on the Calst Binder Hub provided by my colleagues at IT Research Computing. Um, so they have created a uh, a binder hub implementation internal to Calst that is deployed on Calst servers. Um, in this case, you'll get a JupyterLab instance running in your browser. And this we've been using this uh, this whole time for the whole sorry the whole uh, semester. Um, and then, if you're joining us from outside of Calst, if you could just click on it, it says public JupyterLab, but it will take you to the same uh, cloud instance. The difference is that the public Jupyter Lab or public Binder Hub is going to be running on um, uh, typically, but not always, um, donated cloud computing uh, instances somewhere in the world. So I'm just going to go ahead and close this out. So this is the public Jupyter or public Binder Hub, which you can see here. It says hub.gke2, which is Google uh, Kubernetes engine instance two, uh, which is running on top of Google Cloud, um, paid for by one of the uh, grant awards that have been given to the Binder Hub Federation. So I'll close that. Uh, so someone else can have that instance and I will use the Binder Hub instance here at Calst. Okay, and just a reminder, these links can be found on the GitHub repository for the workshop series right at the top. Okay. Um, okay, so I will. Oops. So there's a quote. Uh, so I will copy the link address and paste the link to the Calst Binder Hub into chat. So there's a request for that. So if you click on that, then that should open up um, the Calst Binder Hub directly. Okay. Okay. So and today we're going to be using a terminal. So I'm just going to get. I'm going to touch on this folder icon here to get rid of the um, the file browser on the left hand side, and then I'm going to open a terminal, and then create a little bit of a bigger space. And just to get started, so we'll type PWD, which is print working directory. This will tell us what directory we're in. So we're in the home directory for our user in this cloud instance. Uh, our username is Jovian. And what I will do is I will change directories with the CD command into there should be an introduction to get directory. So I'm going to change into that introduction to get directory. And then we'll just be working from within this directory for, uh, for the rest of today. See, we have some questions in chat. Nope, just comments. OK. All right. So when we use get um, on a new computer for the first time, we can actually see um, get. So if we do which get we can see that here is the git executable that is inside of our conda environment excuse me so we have we do indeed have git installed there are a few things that we need to configure so first we need to configure our, our kind of our name and email address preferred text editor um, and these are things that we prob probably want to um, set globally and across all of our projects. So when we're working on the command line, git commands typically have the form of um, the program name. So they're going to be git, followed by a space, followed by 
um, some verb, which is going to be a command, um, and then some options. And the verb is like the command that describes what we want to do, and then the options control, um, you know, uh, how that command will be carried out. So, for example, um, Dracula is going to to uh, use the following two lines to set up his uh, his git config. So he would write. Uh, git config global and the dash dash global option. So here's our here's our git program and then config, kind of short for configure. So that's the verb and then our options. So we've got global and then we are going to set the user dot name to be Vlad Dracula. And note that because we have a space here, we need to put quotes uh, around the name. And we will hit Enter. And then we will do git config user email. And then uh, Vlad at Transylvania. like this. Okay, now, so these are the two parameters that you will want to set. You're generally going to set them to be global because you will probably have the same username and user email for all your projects. Um, but if you, you can override these on a repository or project specific basis if you need to, you're going to want to use um, a different username and a different user email. In particular, if you want to participate in episodes seven, eight, and nine later today, where we interact with GitHub, you'll want to use your GitHub username and whatever email you use to sign up to um, your GitHub account. So for me, um, we have a teaching uh, account associated with an IBEX training user. And then um an email for that account as well and so i will set my username and email to those settings so that i can interact with github uh, later this afternoon okay so excuse me david yes what did we just do exactly? Did we just assign a name for ourselves whenever we want to commit changes to any repository? We can keep track of who made these changes. Is so correct. So that's a, that, that's a great question. So what we're doing by setting this username and email, um, when we make changes and we commit those changes with Git, the username and user email associated with those changes will get um, added to like the metadata associated with that commit. And that is what will allow us to go back and reference the individual responsible for every set of changes that are committed to the repository. So we're, we're basically setting these, um, uh, setting these values so that the changes that we will make will be, read, will be uh, linked to us. So for example, um, uh, well, yeah, so I'll just leave it, I'll leave it there. So there's a call out box here that um, if you don't want to um, put your user, your email, for example, on GitHub, then what you can do is um, you can just copy. So what I could do is instead of putting the actual Ibex address, I could put my username. And then I could put in this kind of filler email address, which is at users.noreply.github.com. And this would allow me to keep my, um, my user or my email private so that it won't show up all over my GitHub repository um, if I didn't want that to be uh, public and public information. So typically, if you're using Git to contribute to an open source project, um, 
and the project development is done in the open, it's almost always the case that you will use, you will have some email that you will want to use so that uh, collaborators can reach out to you uh, directly if they have questions. Okay. Now, um, one other configuration option we need to set uh, is a little bit technical. Um, but we need to deal uh, coherently with line index. And the reason for this is that. So Mac and Linux, um, Mac and Linux have uh, are both Unix based. Hey, systems. Is um, Mac and Linux are both Unix based systems, and they use the same kind of hidden characters to specify the end of a line in a file. Windows is not a Unix based system and uses a completely different um, character to. Um, specify the end of, it's a hidden character to specify the end of a line in a file. So if you're working on a team and there's a mix of Mac and, and Linux and Windows operating systems, then anytime a Windows user opens a file that you created on Mac or Linux, Windows is going to, it's going to change all the line ending characters to be Windows line ending characters. And then if someone saves those changes and then commits them, then when you take those changes and start working with them, Mac or Linux is going to change the line ending characters back to Mac and Linux or Unix specific line ending characters. And this is just really tedious and annoying. And so we want to completely get around having to deal with this entirely by just configuring our Git repository to always store Unix based line index, which basically means if somebody is working on Windows, and pushes changes that have Windows line endings, then Git will automatically strip them out and replace them with uh, Unix based. And the way that you do this is it just depends on what operating system you use. So if you are using Linux, like we are here, then we do git config global uh, core auto uh, CRLF, which is like the, I think the, the short for the, the line, line endings. And we set it to be input, which basically just means take the user's input for the line endings. Okay. And if you were on Windows, then you would want to set um, that to true, basically. Now, um, one more thing. So when we're working with um, when we're working with Git from the command line, we're going to be prompted fairly frequently to um, make some changes um, or, or to save some stuff with the text editor. And we can configure Git to use a particular text editor of our choice. Um, and there are the configuration options for various um, editors here. Um, for today, I'm going to just use Nano, which you may remember from our shell workshop. It's a small um, uh, terminal-based text editor. And so I'm just going to copy uh, this line here and then just paste it in there and hit enter. Now, if I was work, if I was, you know, on my laptop or workstation, what I would probably do would be to come down here and use um, this uh, because I use Microsoft Visual Studio Code uh, as my day-to-day -day text editor. Okay. Um, and on many Linux systems, the default text editor is Vim, which is very powerful, but High uh, text editor with a high learning curve or steep, sorry, steep learning curve. Um, and this is the cryptic sequence of commands that are required to exit Vim should you ever get stuck in Vim. Um, and if I will, I'll just demonstrate that. So I think if I type uh, VI and hit enter, oh, I, I don't even have Vim on here, I don't think. Oh, good. Yay. I didn't even install Vim. So I saved you from the. Uh, the frustration that is getting stuck in Vim. Um, okay, yay me. Okay. 
Right. Um, one last uh, configuration that we want to make. Let me just check our version. Yeah. So um, we are going to uh, configure the, the name of the branch that's created when we initialize a new repository. Um, the default is um, the default is master, but um, many researchers are um, moving away from using uh, like master and master slave kind of uh, labels for um, well in general, and so in moving forward, Git and GitHub use main as the name of the branch of the default branch, uh, but we need to actually manually set that. So we can manually set that with this configuration option. Okay. Um, right, so these commands, these five commands, we only really need to run them once. And that's why we use the, the global flag to tell Git to modify our global configuration file with these settings. And if we wanna list, look at what our configuration file looks like, we can use the git config command with the list option. And this basically shows us the configuration file. It like, it's like another way of using the command cat on the configuration file itself. Um, so we can see in here the settings that we changed. So here's our uh, Ibex training. So this is my username and then my user email. And notice that although I made several changes to these usernames and emails up here, the last ones, every, every change overwrote the previous setting. Um, and then here was our line endings and then nano and then switching the default branch to be main instead of master. Okay. Um, never run into anybody who had to deal with proxy networks. Um, when you're working from the command line, you will often want to read the help manuals and you can do that with git, git and then the command um, followed by either dash h or dash dash help. Um, oh, there's no man file. Okay, so you need to use dash h. Um, I'm not quite sure why dash dash help didn't work. Um, but you can use dash h to get the same information. Um, and then for a more general help menu, if you do git help, then uh, with git help, you'll see it's like these are the high level commands. And today we're going to be working mostly with, um, we'll see uh, git init, um, git add, um, and commit. We'll be using those quite a bit. As when we get to seven, episode 789, we start dealing with GitHub, we'll talk about pulling and pushing and cloning. And um, git status, which is probably the command we'll run the most today, and you'll see see that in a minute. Um, and that's it. Most of these other commands we won't need to touch today. And in fact, most of these commands, other than the ones that I've just mentioned, I don't even use. So the commands that I'm going to teach you today cover probably well over 99% of Git commands that you will need in to, to work either by yourself or to collaborate with others. Um, oh, and Git diff. We'll be doing Git diff. That's an important one too. And we'll talk about each of those commands as we get to them. Okay, um, any questions about uh, any questions about configuring Git? Okay, moving right along. 
Okay, so let's move to the next one. Okay, creating a repository. So in this episode, I'm going to um, talk about where Git stores its information, and we're going to create a local repository and then talk about this special directory called .git and what it is and why it's, um, why it's important. So picking up where we left off, so we have three collaborators, Dracula, Wolfman, and the Mummy, and then we're going to have some planets and moons that we're going to want to do a bit of research on and write some write some papers about. Um, and so um, we will create, let me just type the clear command to get us some more working space here. So there's a, a question. And if we need to use different credentials for different Git repositories, do we use the dash dash local for each project? So um, uh, the short answer, so let's look at the Git config help. Um, and the answer to that is yes. So we have our global configuration file. And when we are um, inside of a repository, which we'll talk about creating a repository in a minute, you can use the um, local option to overwrite settings like username or email um, for, uh, pro or for projects individually. And so I actually do this sometimes because I have personal projects and then I have and a personal GitHub account. And then I have work that I do here at Kaust. Um, and so I have my own um, username on GitHub that is Kaust specific. And then I have my Kaust email. And so I try to keep my personal projects using my personal GitHub username and a personal email and my Kaust projects using my Kaust username and my Kaust email. This way I can, um, you know, kind of keep my work and my personal uh, development stuff separately, but I do work on the same machine or the same set of machines for all my work, uh, and so I need to do need to change the configuration at the project level. Okay, good question. Okay, um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to create a, a project or directory for our project. So we're going to use the make dir command to create the planets direct a directory called planets. Okay. And so now if we run the list command, we can see that we've created this directory planets here. It's empty, there's nothing in it. But now we can use the cd command to change into the planets directory. Okay, now inside this planets directory, we're going to type the command, our first git command, git init, short for initialize. So that's git and then the verb is init, again, short for initialize and hit enter. And then we are um, told that we have initialized empty git repository in, and then we're given a path to a directory. So the absolute path is slash home slash Jovian, that's our user, slash introduction to Git, which is the directory that we were in, slash planets, which is our planets, um, the name of the project directory that we created, slash dot Git. And so this is the special dot Git directory that we're going to talk about. So the dot Git directory is our Git repository. So a Git repository is a specially structured directory inside your project directory. And because it starts with a dot, it's hidden. So if we run an LS, a simple ls command, it will look like our directory is empty. However, if we run a ls-al to show all the files, then we'll see that there are in fact three directories here dot, which is just a reference to the current directory, dot, dot, which is a reference to the parent directory, in which, in this case, uh, introduction to Git, and then our special dot Git directory, which represents our Git repository. 
Okay. Right. And we can run the git status command. So the git status command um, tells us the, the current state of our git repository um, and the current state of any files in our working directory. And the information that we have is that we are on branch main. So remember, we created a default branch called main when we configured we set our global configuration settings for Git. And so you will always end up on this default branch when you're getting started. We're not going to talk about branches in this introductory lesson on Git, um, but branches are a, uh, or we're not gonna talk about them in detail. The, the concept of branches is that you have kind of a main trunk of your Git repository, which has all of your say working code or all or the most recent draft of um, of your project, say, and then um, like a tree has many branches, you know, each individual collaborator could have their own personal branch where they make their own changes. And occasionally those changes get, um, get combined with the trunk to form a new, you know, most recent uh, version of the project or code. So, the git branch or git flow are two kind of git specific work, two different ways of doing kind of collaborative working um, in git and GitHub. Um, we won't talk about them in this uh, beginning course any more than what I have already said, um, but they are excellent topics for um, a more like an intermediate or advanced git course. Um, and I can point you into some directions on, on that if that's something that you're interested in. Okay, and okay, so now we have a couple of exercises here. And so I would like to give you a few minutes to actually try these exercises um, um, on your own. So note that in this first exercise, um, we're not, uh, we don't have a desktop or anything like that. So we are already in the planets directory. So you don't need to run these first two, uh, these first two commands, but then you can run the rest of these commands um, and see what they do. And then we'll come back uh, in a few minutes and talk about them. And then um, we'll talk about this uh, um, exercise, which talks about how you can correct a mistake where you accidentally initialized a Git repository in a directory that you didn't mean to uh, initialize a Git repository in. As uh, you, will, you will do that at some point, for sure. So I'm just going to go ahead and set a timer for uh, a few minutes, so maybe three minutes, and take a look at those exercises. And, and then we'll talk about them. And I will stop sharing. And feel free to ask any questions that, that you might have. Otherwise, I'll just sit here and drink my tea. So uh, David, I do have a question actually. Yes. Uh, this might be a little too forward i personally don't know how to use git but i do know programs like vs code okay they facilitate you uh using a you know a graphical user interface uh, yes. git functionalities you know to keep track of your source co control or person yes. control so generally when people are uh, working with git do they did for example because you're using visual studio code do you use the version control that's provided through visual studio code or do you do it on the command line separately so I, I tend to do things on the command line, um, in part because I just learned that way. And the, the command line works the same no matter where you are, whether you're in Visual Studio Code or Jupyter Lab or, or wherever. Um, and I haven't, had, I haven't had a reason to 
move away from that basically. Um, but the what I'm finding is that most people who have already like had some exposure to Git, it's as you say, like they're using Microsoft Visual Studio Code or they're using some other text editor that has built in support for Git where you just kind of, instead of typing the commands that we'll see in a minute, like git add files and git commit files and git push and git pull, you, you click on uh, like a GUI interface buttons that do the same thing under the hood. And then you might be prompted to, you know, enter a commit message or, you know, enter some information as part of that process. Um, and in fact, that's the same way in, in Jupyter Lab you can accomplish the same thing. And I'll actually, I'll try to mention that as we go along the, um, the kind of the GUI interface with Jupyter Lab um, as best I can. But in terms of what, if I have a recommendation, it's that, you know, you should try both and then do whatever you find to be uh, easiest. The bigger issue is, is trying to adopt a version control system into your workflow because it will really, you know, I did it when I was a uh, first year PhD student, I think was when I first was exposed to Git and had the time to sit down and actually learn, learn it. Um, and after I learned it, I have, I've never lost any work in the 10 years that I've been using uh, version control systems. And whenever anybody emails me a Word document that they ask me to make changes to, I shudder and immediately start moving towards something. It might not necessarily be trying to get my whole team to adopt Git or GitHub or something like that, particularly if I have a PI that I'm working with who has no interest in learning version control. But even switching to a shared document like a Google Doc or a Microsoft Word document that is on a, um, a shared server someplace where everybody can edit the same file in the same place. Those are big wins over emailing documents back and forth, even if you can't, uh, can't get people to use Kit. Okay. Um, let's, so that my timer just went off. So let's go back and talk about, I see there are some extra questions about the exercise in the chat. So let's go back and talk about the, talk about the exercise. Okay. So, um, so we created this planets, uh, directory and we created a new Git repository inside, uh, planets. So Dracula also wants to, um, create um, a directory for any information that they're going to collect on various moons that they might want to uh, that they might want to study. So Dracula creates a directory called moons inside the planets directory. So here's our moons directory that Dracula created. And here's our git repository. Yeah. Okay. And then um, he says, well, okay, so I created a directory. And so just like in the planets directory, I better change into my moons directory and then run git init again. And so now I've initialized an empty git repository inside the moons directory, which is inside the planets directory, which has its own git repository. Um, and the question is, is this required? And the answer, is no, it isn't. You don't need to do this. So once you have your project directory and you've initialized the Git repository inside your project directory, this will allow you to version control files and folders containing other files and folders inside those folders containing other files. So basically, when we talked about the, um, the file system as having this tree structure in our bash uh, lesson a few weeks ago, so once you've created a Git repository inside a directory, you can version control everything in the file system that sits kind of underneath that, that directory. So that whole kind of subtree within the file system that starts with the, your project directory. So you only need one .git directory for each project directory, right? Um, 
And if we ran git status, okay, so we're still get the on branch main. Um, so one of the things that uh, that you can do is if you run the git status command inside a directory that does not contain a git repository, you will get this output, this error. So if you're kind of ever in doubt, you can run this command before you run git in it. And as long as you're not inside of a git repository, you will get this, this message. All right, so more. So yes, Sarah, the issue here is creating a repo within a repo. You don't need to do that. You only create a single repo, um, a single repository for your project and then control anything down there. Um, so what we're going to do is, so we created this get repo inside a repo and we want to get rid of it. And the way that we get rid of it is to remove it. So uh, remember I said that the get repository is just a directory. I mean, we can see that when we run the LS command. So like this is, this is just a directory here. And from our shell, how do we remove directories? Well, we use, remove dot get and then because it's a directory we have to use dot dash r and then we're done so really the only way that you can um that you can lose work when using git is to do um lose work that has been committed when you're working with git is to do this. If you run rm-r on your .git repository, then you've basically just blown away that whole directory and everything, in it, which is your entire Git repository in this case. So that's like the one command that you have to be very, you have to be sure that that's what you want to do. And in this case, it is what we want to do because we accidentally created this Git repository and we just want to delete it. Um, so that's what you do. You just delete it. Um, and okay. So any questions about, uh, about that? I see there's another question. Um, okay. So if you find, If you end up in this situation where instead of saying on branch main, it says on branch master, then um, was in the previous one. No. Ah, here it is, right here. I was going too fast. So If, if this says on branch master, what you can do is you can run this command to manually force um, switching to a new branch called main. So it's, so, if for whatever reason you didn't get your git config quite right, instead of mucking about with your git config, you can just run this git checkout dash b main, and that will check out the main branch for you manually. Okay, so there's still some confusion with this uh, uh, this episode or this this exercise. So I, I want to make sure you guys understand um, um, git in it. So in this exercise, so cd tilde desktop, we don't need to run this command. So this command would just be changing to changing to your desktop, but we don't have a desktop here. So actually, if you were to try to run this command, you get an error because there is no desktop directory within the cloud instance that we're running. Um, so then we created this planets directory and the moons directory, 
and you only need to run git init inside the planets directory. The planets directory, remember, is like our, our, our root project directory. We only need to run git init inside that directory, and that's it. Every other directory or every other file that we create within the within our project directory, we can version control from the same Git repository. Okay, cool. So let's move right along. Tracking changes. Okay, so this is. You know, obviously creating a repository is important because you know you've got to start somewhere. But the tracking changes is this is probably like the core uh, episode of the entire of the entire workshop. Um, so we're going to learn how to record changes in Git, how to check the status of your version control repository, and um, how to record notes about the changes that you made and why. This is something called a commit message. And then we're going to go through the modify add commit cycle for you know, one file or multiple files. And that's this modify add commit cycle is probably 75 to 80 percent of what I use Git for on a day in, day out basis. I make some changes. That's the modify part. I add those changes to the repository. I commit them to the repository. I make more changes. I add those changes to the repository. I save them with commit to the repository and just go on and go on and go on. So we're going to see that in this, uh, this episode. So we want to be in the planets directory. So if you type PWD, you should see this. OK, so we're going to create a file um, called mars.txt. Now, there's a couple of ways that you can uh, create files today. So you can use Nano if you wish. So you can do, uh, you can follow the lecture notes and have nano mars.txt and hit enter. And that will take you into um, this uh, buffer where we can, uh, we can type, you know, things like cold, and dry, but everything is my, this is Dracula, uh, favorite color. And then we have to use our, our keyboard shortcuts. So you can see the keyboard shortcuts are down here at the bottom. So we might need to hit the control key and X to exit. And then we'll be asked, do you want to save? And we'll hit Y for S. And then it will say, what file do you want to write? And you'll say, it'll say mars.txt, and you hit enter. And then if we use the cat command, this just shows us the contents of the file. We'll see that the file does contain this one line of text. That's a bit tedious. So alternatively, what you can do is if you open your file browser and navigate to introduction to Git, and then into the planets directory, you'll see, so here's this Mars file that we just created. Um, you could actually uh, double click on that file. And now you'll have a text editor within JupyterLab that is more user-friendly. And you can just edit the file from here, save your changes, and then close the file. And so the next new file I create, I'll use the Jupyter Lab interface to create the file instead of the, the nano editor. OK, so we, we created this file. We looked at its contents here. We looked at the contents here in the Jupyter Lab uh, editor. Now let's close that. And uh, we go back. Question, David. Yes. So uh, initially, at the start, we've set our default editors. For example, on my machine, I set it to VS Code. Is yes. there a specific command that just pulls up the default editor uh, for whatever file I want to open? Or do I just ha always have to type code, for example, mars.txt? 
uh, you'll need to type uh, like code and mars.txt. So like the name of the, um, or what, what you can do, if you're using VS code locally, then the easiest thing to do is just to open VS code, point it at the planets directory, and then open a terminal within VS code. Right, right. But I mean, what was the point of setting the default editor in the beginning? That's, ah, I guess that's my question. Right. So the point of setting the default editor in the beginning is if you are working directly from the terminal, basically. So then if you're working from the terminal and Git, Git will occasionally prompt you to automatically open a text editor for you when it needs information from you. Um, like a commit message or something needs you to type some other kind of information. And depending on how you set the default editor, it will open one or the other editors. Ah. Um, and so in our case, we won't encounter too many instances where Git will automatically in the background, what, what Git does in the background is it actually would run um, code, the code command and then the file for you. It would kind of do it in the background. Um, but in general, you're going to have to run it yourself. Or again, if you're using VS Code locally, you're probably best just to open a terminal from within VS Code and, uh, and work that way. OK, clear. Thank you very much. Yep. OK. Um, right. OK, so now that we've made, uh, we've created a new file, we've added some text to it. If we run git uh, not statu, status. Um, we'll see now we have some um, some more content. So we have in red here, we have, and this might be, well, it'll be red if you're using the, the compute instances here. If you're using a local Git, it may or may not be colored. I don't know. Um, we have mars.txt and this directory ipy nb checkpoints, which I'll tell you how to ignore in a minute um, or later today. But these are, Git notices that these are untracked files because it, it says, ah, I, I see that there are files and folders inside of this Git repository directory or inside of this directory, which contains this Git repository. But I don't have any record of these files in the repository at all. So they're not tracked yet. So I'm gonna mark them as red to kind of tell you that, hey, you might wanna run this Git add and then the file name to actually add the file. Okay, so we will follow the instructions. So we will use the git add command, and then we will pass mars.txt, and we will add the file mars.txt to the repository. Okay, now if we run git status again, we'll see yet, um, we'll see a different uh, setup. So now in green, we have some changes to be committed and we have a new file mars.txt. So basically now Git's made a little note in the, in the repository that there is this new file mars.txt, but we haven't actually saved these changes yet. We've kind of put them into a, um, I don't know, you can think of it as like a loading dock or like a temporary space. And the reason that we do that is that we might have other files or other changes that we want to combine together in the same set of changes. And then we want to commit all of those changes together as one kind of commit to the repository. So that's why we have, we're going to have this like staging area and then the repository where we commit from the staging area to the repository. And I'll, I'll show you there's some, some pictures about that down here that will make it maybe a bit clearer. Okay, so let's use the uh, the git commit command to commit these changes. So I'm just going to run clear, I think. Yeah, so clear just to clear out the, the workspace. Now, if I run git commit, and then I need to put a message. And so this is a, the commit message. And a commit message um, is like an explanation of what changes were made or why we made those changes. Typically, you, you want your commit message to be more about like why those changes were made rather than what the changes were, because you can always go and look at the old version and the new version and see what lines of the file were changed. The commit message adds helpful context if it explains like why you made those changes. 
Um, but you know, that's just kind of a, a bit of advice on how to write useful commit messages. So um, why did we make these changes? Well, because we were uh, started uh, taking notes on Mars as possible base. And then we hit enter. And then what we get is the, the, um, the response of from making the commit from the Git repository is to provide, so this is the name of the, the branch that we're making the commit to. This is something that's called uh, the commit hash. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then we see here's our commit message that we just typed. Then we get some summary statistics like, well, there was one file change and we added one line to that file. And then because this was a new file that we created, um, this file was created um, and this create mode relates to file permissions, which I'm not gonna go into right now. And then this is the name of the file. Okay. Now, if we run git status, Again, you can see git status is like the best command. We run it all the time. Um, the, uh, we see that we have, we're on our branch main and we still have this weird directory of untracked files, um, but we're gonna ignore that in a, in a minute. Um, but other than that, we don't have any, um, no, no untracked files or no changes to be, commit, to be committed. Okay, so that's nothing to commit working directory clean is usually what you will get. Okay. Now, another command, git log. Oop, not git low, git log. So git log gives you a kind of a reverse, chronicle, log, reverse chronological order listing of all of your git commits. So here we have a commit, and here we have the full commit hash, which is a, the commit hash is a, just a unique identifier for that set of changes in the Git repository. So it's a, I think like a 36 character string. Um, and you can see the first uh, seven characters are listed here. Like when we made the commit, we get the first seven letters or seven characters, but the full commit hash is uh, I think like 32 characters or something like that. Well, Okay, and so as we build up changes, we'll see this git log will get longer and longer and longer um, and we'll navigate it and do some other stuff. Okay. Um, right, so I mentioned at the very beginning of, of the day that version control systems like git store documents and changes separately. So that the begs the question of, well, where are the changes? So, um, okay, so there's a question in chat. So what do we, what exactly is meant here by commit? So um, let me see if, okay. So I'm just gonna jump ahead a little bit um, to this graphic here to really hammer home the difference between git add and git commit. So here we have our base document and let's say we make some changes. So that was like, that was the adding the line to the mars.txt file. And so we made that change to the file. And then we needed to run the git add and git add took this, uh, took this change, just the change and added it inside the .git directory into the staging area. Now, we might've wanted to make a whole bunch more changes each of which we would need to add to the staging area or change other files and add those to the staging area. But once we had a collection of changes that we wanted to save permanently to the repository, we run the git commit command, which collects these changes and then drops it on top of the repository stack. And with that commit, we add a little note little message to our future selves or to our collaborators about like, why did we make, why did we make those changes? Okay. So we're gonna do this process a lot, kind of like over and over and over again. And then, um, okay. 
uh, where were we? Okay, so where are my changes? So if you run like ls, you'll see that, you know, here's this file, but what about the, so that's the file, but what about the changes? So again, so the changes are saved in the .git directory. So every, what we see in our working directory is the current or the most recent versions of our files. What's saved in the .git directory is a history of all the changes. And so if we wanted to, we could go in and swap out the version and our of files in our working directory with some previous version of the files uh, by applying or removing changes that we've applied in the Git repository. Okay, so let's make some more changes. So if we open our uh, mars.txt file, we can go in here and add um, uh, uh, another line. So the two moons might be a problem for Wolfman, because if he turns into a werewolf, whenever the moon is full with two moons, he's going to turn into a werewolf twice as often, which might be mildly annoying. So we save these changes. So you can do control S or or command S to save, or you can come up here and just do file, save text. Okay. And then we'll close the file. And then if we come over here and we run uh, git status. Okay. So now git detects that we made that change. So it sees that we've made modifications to mars.txt that we have not added. Um, yet. Okay. So again, we've added the changes. So if we come down here to our graphic, we've made a change and we've added it, uh, or sorry, we haven't added it yet. We haven't done anything. We've just made the change. Right. And uh, it tells us that we have not staged these changes yet for commits. So staging is the process of kind of moving the changes to the staging area using the git add command. Okay. Um, so now we're gonna learn a new command called git diff. So if we do um, git diff and then mars.txt, we get some information about the differences of the modifications that were made. So this tells us the difference between the mars.txt that is saved in our, um, our current working directory and the version of um, mars.txt that uh, exists inside our Git repository. So you can see, so here's the kind of the version that would be inside the Git repository. And then this is the modification that we have in that file in the current working directory. So there's a good question in, in chat. So is the repository physically in each team member's computer or is it in a centralized server? It is physically in each team member's computer. There might be a version, an extra copy that exists on GitHub, for example, in a centralized location that everyone can use to coordinate. Um, but right now, each individual team member is going to have a copy of the repository on their local computers. And that will always be true. Um, uh, okay, so if you're using Nano, so of course, if you do nano um, mars.txt. Yeah. So this opens mars.txt. Now, you can't um, type your changes and then close it like you would uh, you're closing a text file because that will close your terminal. 
So what, instead, what you need to do is you have to use the keyboard shortcuts to close not the whole terminal, but just this buffer where you're, where you're typing. So to do that, you've got to use these shortcut commands at the bottom, like uh, control X, for example, to exit out. Alternatively, if you're having trouble getting Nano to work, don't worry about it, because Nano is not a text editor that you will uh, generally ever have to use, except in slightly extreme situations such as this. What you can do is just use JupyterLab to navigate and open the uh, create new files and open files that way. Um, okay, so uh, Butu, we will talk about. Uh, he has a question of you know how to know which repository is the most up to date version. So we will talk about uh, that process of coordinating amongst multiple uh, um, versions later when we talk about GitHub. Because what you will, uh, the preview of the answer is that when you have a team of multiple people, each with their own local copy, they will um, share their changes with a central, um, a central copy on GitHub. And then other collaborators will need to pull down the changes of their collaborators onto their local copies and merge them in. And if there are conflicts, like people have changed the same file in the same place, then there's a process for navigating that. Uh, another good question. So if somebody makes mistakes, how to revise the commit instead of making another commit? We're, we're going to talk about that. Um, that's an important topic. We'll talk about that later this afternoon. OK. Um, so the output of this git diff message, so there's an example here um, similar to what, uh, what we had uh, here. Um, it's a bit cryptic, uh, but this first line um, um, tells us that uh, git is producing a similar output to this command, um, which uses a different diff tool um, that is exists on most Linux uh, or most Unix-based systems um, by default, but we can just kind of ignore that. Um, and the second line uh, tells us which versions um, are being compared. And this is some unique identifier for the first version. This is some unique identifier for the second version. These are not things that I ever use, um, but if you're wondering what, what they are, um, uh, so it's this part that is usually relevant that I, I would look at. So I look at kind of, I'll come over here, you know, look at, you know, what existed before I made the change and, you know, what was actually changed in green. So if we removed, if we had text that we had removed, it would show up in red. In this case, we just added one line of text. So it shows up in green. Okay. So now that we've added these uh, changes, so I'm going to clear this out and I'll run the git status command again. So now that we have added the changes, we can commit them um, and we'll add a commit message, a little note to ourselves that says that um, we wanted to document some concerns from. Okay. Uh, ah, huh. what happened here? So actually we hadn't added the changes. I thought that we had, but then we have not. So you can see what happened when I ran this git commit. It just basically returned and said at the bottom, no change is added to the commit. And it reminds me that I need to use git add to add them. So first I need to do git add mars.txt. Um, and now we're ready to do git commit. Okay. And now we get the, the kind of the response that we wanted that we have actually committed things. And if we were to look at our git log, we can see now that we have, we have two commits. And they're in reverse order. So we have 
this most recent commit. And then before that, we have the original commit that we made. Okay. And again, it's important that we have this separate staging area. Um, and we have we do have this modify add commit cycle instead of just like a make changes and save them. And the reason is that when you have a, a project that has many files, you often want to group together changes to different files as one and save them as one logical step. So this will come up a lot in research work where you know, I might have a Python project that has many different Python scripts. And if I want to change the functionality of this, uh, of the project, I might need to make changes to several different scripts. And I want to combine all of those changes across multiple files into a single commit and save it in case, you know, later, if I want to come back and undo it, I need to undo all of the changes to all the different files. And it's better to group changes together in logical units and make a commit rather than commit every little change. Um, because that makes it more difficult to undo the changes later if you've made a mistake. So uh, git diff returns nothing if we committed the changes. Yeah, so if you uh, actually, as we'll see in a minute, as long as you've added the changes, git diff will return nothing because what git diff will compare is this version here, the version in your working directory with the version inside the .git directory, which includes both the staging area and the, the repository. But we'll, we'll see an example of that in a minute. Right, okay. Um, so let's add, let's make another change. So we're gonna open our mars.txt file again. And I'm gonna add another line, um, but the mummy will appreciate the low humidity. humidity. And now I will can do file, save text. And now I'll close the file. And so now if we do um, git diff, we'll see that, well, yep, here it git sees that we've added this new line to the file. Okay. Now I'm just gonna clear this out again. So let's add the file again. So we're gonna do git add mars.txt. And now if we run git diff, so Sarah, this gets to your, uh, your question. So we added the changes. And now if we run git diff mars.txt, we don't get anything because it's comparing the version in our working directory with the version inside the .git directory, which currently is in the staging area. So if we wanna compare, um, if we've added some changes, but we wanna do like the normal diff without you know, unadding the changes, then we can do git diff and the staged option with the file and then we'll get that result. So I do this sometimes, I do this staged option sometimes when I, when I, basically when I'm going too fast and I just add a bunch of stuff and I'm like, oh man, like what did I just add? I've forgotten. And then I'll run git diff rather than, um, you know, use a different command which can unadd the files. I'll just go in and do git diff staged option to see what it was that I added. Okay. So now we can, now we're ready to make another commit. So if we do git commit, um, and then our commit message will be, um, you know, Mummy shared some thoughts on Mars humidity. And now if we run get status, not much to do. 
and then we can run git log. And now you can see we're adding, um, adding to our log of changes and commits. Okay. Um, now there's some options, some other configuration that you can do. So if instead of doing like by default, Git does these like line based diffs. So here it says, oh, you added this whole new line or you removed a whole line. You can do word based um, differencing, which would actually notify you of changes within a line. So like if somebody went in and just like edited a few words within a line, um, you would need to do the uh, get diff with a color words option um, to highlight uh, change words um, using different colors. So what would be an example of that? So suppose that, um, okay. So suppose that we opened this up and then someone came in here and changed low to high and saved the file. So if we then did uh, git diff, okay. So here with just by default, git diff will say, oh, well, it looks like what happened is that somebody deleted this whole line and then added this whole other line. But these two lines are the same with the exception of this individual word. So if you did uh, git diff with the color words option, and I'll put the file name in there this time, you'll get something like this. So you can see, really see more in a more fine grained way what the actual change was. Um, this is kind of a personal preference. Most of the time, I don't bother with the color words option. Um, it, I could see how it would come in handy if you were doing a lot of like fine grained editing of either uh, like a text document um, uh, where you were being really particular about the words that you were using with your colleagues uh, or if you're editing some some code and you're writing a bunch of functions and you were going back and forth and changing like the different arguments for functions, then I could see that as being a useful application of, of this colored words uh, option. Um, right, so I'm gonna clear this and now I'm gonna do a get status again. And so now I've got these changes um, that uh, that I made and I kind of want to unmade them. So I'm going to follow here and then do git restore mars.txt. And now if I run the git status again, you can see that the file modifications have gone away. And if I was to open this file and look at it, now the change of high has gone back to low. So this uh, git restore command um, kind of takes changes that were, um, or takes modifications that were made that had not been added yet and kind of just removes them. You can think of it as like delete. I use that command a lot um, when, get back. To, so I, I use that command a lot because it, you know, I, I do a lot of software. I use Git to mostly version control software. And so I'll typically be writing some code and testing the code and writing some code and testing the code. And if I, I make some changes to the code and I try to test it and it breaks, um, sometimes it's easier just to run uh, Git restore and the file name and blow away all the changes that I made and go back to a version that worked and then start over rather than go back and, and kind of try to figure out what's, what else is going on. So I, I use that git restore command a lot. Um, you can make some settings changes to the log, um, the way the log information is displayed. I don't wanna go, um, and go over that too much. Uh, I do wanna mention um, directories. So git tracks files, not directories. So let's suppose if we made um, another directory 
spaceships. And then we did get status. So git doesn't, it doesn't even see that spaceships directory. And if we try to manually add it, uh, it doesn't do anything. Um, and if we run git status again, it's like there's nothing there. So um, if you want to add a directory like as a placeholder, then what you need to do is, um, is inside that directory, you can just create a little empty file called git keep. And this is like a little, a special file that's used to create placeholder empty directories in Git. So if you do that, and then run Git status, now Git does, it sees like, oh, there's the spaceships directory here and you could add and then commit that directory. Um, so an example of, of where this comes up is actually in the introduction to uh, data science workshop, I created a whole bunch of directories in here. And many of these directories have, are just empty. They're like placeholders for future training or materials that we'll, we created. Um, so for example, if you look in the introduction to Git, there's just this Git keep file, which is just a placeholder. And it just allows me to create this repo that has this empty directory that I wanted to have already pre-created pre, pre basically. Same for the introduction to Conda course. Um, and there are some other placeholder directories in there as well. Okay, um, I think I will just remove dir, the spaceships directory. Oh, ah. So you can't remove, if you remember back from the shell course, you can't remove a directory that's not empty. So what I need to do is remove the spaceship directory recursively. Okay, um, looks like we've got some questions in chat. Um, qu the question is, do you always have to run the git add command uh, prior to git commit? So yes, although I believe up here, there is a discussion of um, hmm, I thought it's, uh, uh, okay, so it's mentioned in the, okay. So you can do the git commit, um, git add and then git commit in one command, by doing git commit and then passing the dash a option. So let's look at the help menu for git commit. Okay. So that's git commit dash h will give you this help menu. And if you look in here, here. So there's this dash a or dash dash all option, which will commit all changed files. And that has the um, um, effect of running the git add on all the changed files and then committing them at one time. So that's like a handy shortcut. If you've made, if you've made a bunch of changes to files and you just want, and they're all changes that you're gonna add and commit together in a single commit, you can just do git commit with a dash A and that will do it all in one command. I think there was another question that I, um, so git, git restore takes change modifications in your current working directory and removes them. There's a separate command for taking changes. So let's, um, let's go back to our diagram here. So what git restore does is it removes this green line. So if I ran git restore, on this file, it would just remove that green line, that's it. If I had already added this change to the staging area, there's another command that would remove these changes from the staging area and then remove them from the, the document in the working directory. And then there's yet another command, if you've gone all the way and added and committed the changes, there's another command that undoes the whole process 
or that undoes each of the stages of the process. Okay. Okay, da, 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 where are we? Uh, so I talked about directories. Um, okay. So here's a, again an example of, of why the staging area. So we've got two files, we make changes some changes to file one, some changes to file two, but these are logically related. So maybe these are two different um, Python scripts where one Python script describes data loaders and PyTorch that are going to, talk, are going to uh, take image files and load them into the GPU. And then file two needs to reference those data loaders and maybe pass some, some new um, configuration options into the data loaders. So these two changes, two sets of changes in two different files are logically related. So we add both files individually, and then we commit both sets of change or um, both sets of changes together as one commit. So we take we put them both in the staging area with two separate git add commands, and then we run git commit to take the staging area changes and drop them on top of the repository to update the repository. Alternatively, as I just pointed out, you could also do git commit with a dash dash all or dash a option, and that would have added both of these to the staging area and committed them in one command. Okay. Um, so let's take um, okay, so we start at one. All right, so I propose the following. So let's take a 10 minute break. Um, have a go during the break, you know, make a cup of tea, you know, take a bathroom break, whatever. And then um, have a go at these exercises. In particular, you know, they basically give you practice on, you know, committing some files, you know, making new files, committing files, um, making a new repository. Um, so this might be a good one. So you know, create a whole new directory outside of the planets directory. So somewhere else, not in the planets directory. Um, create that directory, um, create a file and, you know, write some changes, basically. The, the, create a new Git repository with a little file that has a little bit about yourself and, and give yourself a practice of that. Creating a repository and then a modify add commit cycle. Okay, and then we'll come back at say maybe, um, let's come back at 3.05. So we'll take a 15 minute break. That will give you some extra time to do the exercises and maybe have a good 10 minute uh, break. And then we'll pick up at 3.05 with exploring history. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording now. Okay, so we're back to we're back from break. Any questions uh, about the material that we've covered before I, I pick up with um, with the next episode? Okay, looks like not. All right, I'm sure there are questions, but they're just questions that uh, no one wants to ask. There are always questions. <clears throat> okay, so now we are going to pick up with the next episode, which is on exploring history. And uh, in this episode, we're going to talk about how to identify old versions of files, how to review changes, and importantly, how to recover old versions of files. So I think someone uh, in the chat asked a question about this earlier. How do I recover old versions of files? And we're going to talk about that in this episode. Um, and so in the course of this episode, we're going to cover the Git head, um, or the head of a repository, what is it and how, how you use it. Um, we're going to use our Git commit numbers. So I mentioned these, each commit gets its own unique hash number, and we're going to actually use those numbers to do stuff. Um, we'll see how to compare uh, different versions like of files, so the version in the current and the working directory with some previous version um, at 
um, some previous state or commit of the Git repository, and then how to restore old versions. Okay. Um, so let's let's get started with that. So I'm just going to clear clear this out. Okay. And uh, let's take a look at our Mars file. Okay. So we have um, we have these three lines. And now let's, I'm just going to open the file and add um, an ill considered change. So basically, this is a change that is a bad change, and we're probably going to want to delete it or remove it. But we have to make a bad change before I can show you how to correct it. So now I've saved that. I'll close the file. And so now let's talk about um, head. So you can refer to the most recent commit of the working directory by using that identifier head. And you may have, if you had eagle eyes, you may have spotted head when we ran the git log command earlier. So here's head, and it points to the most recent commit uh, in the repository. So, um, so far, we have been using um, git diff to just compare, um, by default, to compare the most, uh, the working directory with the most recently um, committed version. But the git diff command actually has a different syntax where you can uh, explicitly say, I want to compare the difference between the a version at a particular a particular location or particular commit in the Git repository and the current version in the working directory. Okay. Um, and so here is the result of that diff. So we have this ill-considered change that we just added. And that's not anywhere in the Git repository. So it's just this one line. Right. Now, we can actually refer to previous, not just head. We can actually use head as a starting point and then go backwards. So if we wanted to compare the current version of the file mars.txt with the version of mars.txt not at this commit, but rather at this commit. We could do head tilde one. And so that, that tilde one means go one commit back from the head. And so now if you compare the version of the file at this commit, which is one behind the head commit, the difference between mars.txt at that commit and the current version of mars.txt is these last two lines that were added in the current working version. Similarly, if you do head tilde two, you'll get these three lines. So head tilde two would be head, head tilde one, head tilde two. And so head tilde two was the first version or the first commit that we made actually. And if you remember when we created the file mars.txt, we actually created it and added this line. So this first line was included as part of the first commit. Now, of course, if we try to go back further than the we try to go back to a commit that doesn't exist. We get uh, we get an error that looks like this. Okay. Um, now, here we were using the, uh, this git diff. I mean, we we're using the git diff command to compare. Um, different versions and we were getting the differences um 
So what we could do is we could use a, another command, git show. I don't use this. I use git diff a lot. I don't use git show that much. Um, which will show us a little bit more information than just the, the differences. So if we do a git show, Oops, uh, I have to put in an actual correct, let's do tilde one. Um, we get the actual commit for head tilde one, as well as who did it, when did they do it, the commit message, plus all of the information about the actual diff. So you might do, in, in practice, how would you use these commands? Well, in practice, you might do something like, um, what was the difference between these two files? And then you might, might say, ah, you know, who is responsible for the, the, the you know, this, who is responsible for the file? Who, who made the commit that's associated with head tilde two? And then you could say, ah, well, that was this person and they made it on this date and then um, you know, you could go and talk to them about what was going on. Okay. Um, so instead of using these head, uh, head tilde one or, you know, head tilde 123 to go 123 commits back, you can actually use these um, commit identifiers. So these commit hashes. So they're actually 40 characters long. Um, and you don't actually have to use the whole 40 characters. You can just use, all you need to do is put in enough of the characters for there to be unique, um, for it to be unique. So if we do git log, and then if I did, um, instead of git head, sorry, let's do this, git diff, and then I could say, well, let's try, um, I mean, you can use the whole commit identifier mars.txt, but you actually don't need the whole. You could just do uh, git diff, and then um, in this case, actually, the first numbers are all different. So I might be able to get away with just one. We'll see. Yeah, OK. So one is not enough, even, even though if I were to compare this commit identifier, this commit identifier, so you know, this one and this one, I could see that they start with different numbers. I try to use just one, one isn't enough. I can try to use the first three, that's not enough. I think they force you to use like seven or something like that, uh, three, four. So there we go. So that's six. So six, six apparently is, is enough um, of an identifier to get started. Um, right. Okay. So we covered that. Um, all right. So let's go back. So those were just some examples of um, how to reference different versions of yeah. files. So let's go back to the, uh, to get status. Okay, so we've made this ill-considered change, but we haven't added it yet. So I, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm gonna go over it again. If, we, if we've made an, a change that we don't like and we haven't added it yet, all we have to do is follow the kind of prompts here and use git restore. So it says git restore followed by file or files will discard changes in your working directory. Oh, so we could do git restore mars.txt, and that will get rid of changes in your working directory. And so now you can see this ill-considered change that we had added is now gone. Um, right. Um, there, there was a command called git checkout, which did that. Um, but checkout, um, git checkout is like a Swiss army knife. It does 
so many different things that um, Git has just creating as the as the Git versions, the newer Git versions, they are creating individual commands to target specific use cases where you used to use Git checkout with some options because Git checkout is too complicated of a command. So Git restore, you should use Git restore um, to uh, discard changes in your working directory. Right. Um, um, also, if you're using this git checkout command, you can get into a, what's called a detached head state. Um, if it ha don't bother worrying too much about what it is. Um, but if you get a message that looks like this, um, then don't make any changes and just do git checkout main and that will reattach your uh your head okay okay um so if you want to undo or if you want to revert the git um the Git repository back to some previous state, like you want to you want to rewind and undo one commit or several commits, you have to um, you have to go back to the commit before the change that you want to undo. So if you only go back to the change that you want to undo, then that's going to rewind your your git repo to the to the commit that you actually want to undo so you have to go like one behind that in order to undo that commit so i'll see we'll see an example of that uh, in a minute um okay so here's kind of again like a cartoon idea so you've got this checkout window um and you've got your little person in here doing version control. So you're making all of these modifications over here to your different files, and then you're using the git add command to add them into the staging area. Yeah. And then once you're happy, you do a git commit, and that assigns this unique commit identifier and takes this collection of changes from the staging area and, and puts it over here on top of the repository. And now if you use the git checkout command, you can uh, use the git checkout command to pull versions of older versions of particular files from older commits and bring them back out to the working directory. Okay. So um, Let's see an example. I didn't actually do an example of that. So let's let's do that. So um, okay. Suppose that um, we wanted to restore the original version of the file mars.txt. So what we could do is we could do um, git checkout and let's copy this version or this kind of the first few characters of the identifier we could all also do head tilde uh, one two mars.txt okay okay and now if we run git status we can see that their modifications have been made uh, to mars.txt and if we open mars.txt, we can see that these modifications um, have now taken mars.txt back to the original version that we saved. Okay. Now, if we want to um, get rid of those versions, um, um, or if we want to say, okay, well, actually, I didn't want to check that version out. I want to kind of reset it back to um, back to what it was before I did the checkout, 
you can follow this command here, git restore staged. Oh, and then I need to add the, the name of the file. And now if I do git status, we have this mars.txt. And then, so that has, that has removed um, the modifications from the staging area. And now we need to do a git restore mars.txt. And now we're back to the mars.txt that we um, that we had before we did the checkout. Okay. Uh, question, David. Yes. So we just saw how to restore a specific file back to a previous uh, committed yes. state. Let's say uh, I want to stay at that state, use that file. And make some other changes, you know. Uh, do I have to go back and say git add that specific file, then commit it to work from there? Okay. So what we what we saw. So let let's suppose. Um, okay. Um, so so let's go back up here. So here we did this checkout, right? So we pulled an old version of this file, and we looked at the git status. So from the status, we can see that. When we did the checkout, Git said it right. Okay, we're taking this old version of the file, but the 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 modifications that that file represents are already kind of added. So what you could do is you could say, well, you could either do Git commit here, and that would add another commit on top of head that would effectively restore these old versions of the file to the current versions. And then you could go on from there and do modify, add commit, and make more commits from there. Or you could go ahead and make additional changes to mars.txt at this point, and then commit those changes um, together with the checkout. I would probably, if I wanted to rewind my repo to a particular previous commit, I would probably do a git checkout of that commit. Um, let's say I just want to rewind the whole repository, like go take all the files and take them back to the, their state at that point. Then I would do a git checkout of that commit. And then I would do a git commit and then basically say, you know, reverted repo back to, you know, a previous commit or something like that, and then start on from there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. But I mean, doing the checkout, then commit right afterwards, it just takes us back. I mean, you'd have two uh, commits that are exactly the same, essentially. Just well, taking an older commit and put it up at the head. Right. I mean, so it depends on, right. So if you did that, so let's say I, you know, I checked out this one here and then did, and then immediately committed it. So that would basically be like the, the, if you think of it as like the documenting the whole flow of the, the history of my project, what that would be saying is that, you know, these changes and these changes that I saved in these two commits turn out to be rubbish for whatever reason. And then the fact that I, checked out this version and then committed it immediately is basically saying that I'm undoing these two previous commits. So it's not, it, it's not that the same commit appears twice. It's that it appears the first time. And then when you commit, uh, when you do the checkout and then you commit again, that's creating a brand new commit that effectively undoes um, some other work or undoes uh, some other commits. Right, I understand. Uh, I guess for the flow of change, it might be easier the way you're saying it to track it, just to show that we've committed an older state and this is where we're starting from. So yeah. I, I get I get what you're saying. Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that we're so now like these type of questions are are getting a little bit into like um like subjective areas on like what kind of workflow is optimal for like you or for your for your team. So many or most like software development teams, like whether they're here at Calst or you know in some business, um, commercial business here in Saudi Arabia or, or anywhere that uses anywhere that uses version control, they will have a specific workflow that they have adopted on how to how to how to do these things. So they will have like when you want to revert a commit then you do the following stages, the following sequence of Git commands. Because as long as everybody is kind of using the same, um, the, the same mechanism for, you know, reverting changes or documenting it, then you, you get more consistent documentation for how the changes were made. And usually you don't want to lose when you're using version control like this, you, you want to have all these intermediate um, stages where maybe you made a bunch of commits and then, then you, these commits turned out to be bad. By checking out and then adding a new commit, it, it allows you the opportunity to document why those changes were bad. If you just kind of like, you know, there's other Git commands that you can use to just like erase past history or erase previous commits. I'm not going to cover them today, but you can look them up in the Git documentation. That's almost like, um, that's generally not desirable because by erasing commits, you're losing that opportunity to document for the future, like why those commits were bad. It would be like, you know, it, again, if you think about version control as being your digital lab notebook, you know, you probably would not take you know, it wouldn't be good science to take um, your lab notes from a failed experiment and, you know, throw them in the trash and burn them and then keep doing that until you got a correct experiment and then only keep your lab notes from that correct experiment. You would lose so much knowledge of different things that you tried and, and, and different ways in which the experiment went wrong if you, like, chucked out those those notes on the failed experiments. So that, that's another way to think of it. So there's a question. Um, we'll be talking about different scientific workflows that we can incorporate Git into. Um, so I will provide, that's not a topic that we'll have time to discuss today. I can provide some links. Uh, I'll probably put them in the, the YouTube video description um, because I'll, I'll pull them up um, and, and add them there um, that will provide links to um, either books or other resources on um, different workflows for Git and scientific uh, applications. But that's kind of like a more advanced topic. So we have to teach the basics on how to use Git. And then um, we haven't had enough um, user interest yet to justify creating an advanced Git training where we would talk about some of these scientific workflows. Um, but it, that would be a good thing to note in your feedback form. So you'll get a link to a feedback form tomorrow with the link to the YouTube video when I post it. So if you have that kind of feedback or request for that kind of training um, is a great thing to add to those feedback forms. Um, because if we do get enough requests for a certain kind of training, we'll try to make it happen. Okay. Um, all right, so we talked about that. Okay, so there are some exercises here. Um, so let's take five minutes and have a look through, uh, you can have a look through these exercises and if you have any questions about them, um, I'll be happy to answer them. Just set timer. <clears throat> David. Yes. Um, 
can you explain a bit more why for the exercise you showed we did get uh, restore dash dash stage and then had to do again get restore on the same file that part is very clear to me sure um Okay. Okay, here. So when we did the git checkout, we checked out an older version of the file mars.txt and brought it out of the .git directory and into our working directory and replaced the version in the working directory. So when we do that checkout, git kind of automatically adds those modifications to the staging area. So let me try to find, where's our, okay. So we did the git checkout of this old version of mars.txt. And then what happened is that when we did that checkout, um, it moved the old version to the working directory and then kind of added it to the staging area. So it overwrote the version in the working directory, but then automatically staged the changes. So when we run the git restore staged command, that takes these changes that were automatically placed in the staging area and unstages them. Then when we run the, uh, and we can see that here. So we ran uh, the git restore with the staged option, and then we ran git status. And then we could see that the modifications were still there, but now they're in the working directory. And we can run the git restore command to get rid of those. And then we run the git restore command. And then that erased the, the changes and took us back to where we started. So it's kind of, it's, it's back to this, like um, the, the staging area. Um, when you do the checkout, things end up in the staging area and you need to get them out of the staging area before you can erase the modifications. So it's like this two-stage process. Okay. So let's, so are there any questions? Um, make sure I'm in the right place. Any questions about the, um, the exercises? You know, for those of you who thought that this course was going to focus more on uh, incorporating Git into your scientific workflows, um, I'll have to have a look at the advertisements. I don't think that the advertisements really pushed that that was going to be a focus of the uh, agenda today, um, but I will have a look at them. It was certainly not my intent to cover that material today. Um, in my experience, the Git is one of those topics where Google can can very easily lead you astray, um, and that you know there are many good reference books for Git, and so you can get your hands on you know a reference book uh, for Git and and certainly learn the basics that way. Um, but 
you know, just kind of Googling about for the, the, the basic commands for Git and running them without really understanding the, what it is that you're doing is likely going to cause you a lot of grief and cause you to not uh, um, get very frustrated with Git because it's one of these, uh, it, it's a slightly, when you're first exposed to it, it's, it's um, well, I mean, it can be a little tedious. Um, you know, it has a steeper learning curve than say Python or, um, or maybe even shell. And so um, I have found these workshops to be very useful in helping um, get users over that initial energy barrier for that, get up and get them up that learning curve to the point where they can run off and use Google, but use Google effectively and not let them lead it astray. It's a lot easier with to Google um, Google like Python issues and get a coherent answer because you'll Google something related to Python and you'll end up on Stack Overflow and Stack Overflow Python answers are usually pretty good. If you Google like how do I do something in Git, you'll also end up on Stack Overflow. But then the the cryptic Git command that is suggested in Stack Overflow, you know may or may not still do what uh, what it says it does. Whoop. Okay, I thought I lost my uh, my compute instance for a minute. I was talking too much. Um, let me share my screen again. And we'll move right along. Ignoring things. Um, sometimes there are things that you don't want to version control. And how do we, um, how do we tell Git to ignore stuff? Um, so the short version of this is that there's a special file. It's called uh, uh, Git Ignore or dot git ignore. And if we create this file, so the easiest way to create it would just be to do, all right, so let me clear this out. And, okay. So in our project directory, we will create a, um, a file called dot git ignore. And then, um, let's see, can I see this file in my, hmm. Okay, and <clears throat> I guess we'll use nano. Then. So I will use nano to edit the dot git ignore file. And then in here, um, we can add stuff. So let's add uh, dot i pi in B checkpoints. Okay, so this is that directory that kept showing up as being untracked in all of our um, git status command output. And we don't care about this directory, so we're just going to ignore it. It has to do with the checkpointing mechanism for Python or Jupyter notebooks. Um, so we'll just ignore it. So now that we've typed this in here, we can hit control X for exit and then Y for yes to save and then enter. And now if we run get status, we have the dot git ignore file, which we need to add and commit, but the other untracked file, the IPython checkpoints directory is now gone. Um, so other use cases for this would be like, um, sometimes you'll have, like in scientific analysis, you often have a lot of intermediate files and maybe these intermediate files are either really large or actually they're just created. You've got some input scripts, you run these scripts, a whole bunch of intermediate files are created as well as some final output. And you don't really care about the intermediate files. So you can just ignore all the intermediate files and only save the outputs. 
Um, so, you know, there's uh, an example here where um, we create maybe some data files and then some results files, and then we uh, ignore the data files and the results files. So uh, I'll just do this. So if we made a results directory, and then we uh, created some, let's make another directory, a data directory. And then um, in the data directory, we'll create uh, a.dat data b.dat data c.dat. And then um, in the results directory, we'll create a.out b.out and c dot out. Okay. Now if we do get status, so we still have our git ignore file, which we haven't added yet, but now we've got these two directories, data and results. So you know what we could do is we could open the the git dot git ignore file and then we can add some more directories. So we could add our data directory and our results directory. Um, if we had, we can do things like um, pattern matching. So um, um, so here in the example, in the notes, they did it slightly differently. So they created these data files in the project directory, and then they just had this results directory. So you can use pattern matching. So you could ignore files with a particular extension with this kind of a pattern. Um, anyway, so once you once you add the things that you want to ignore to the git ignore file, you do control uh, control X, yes, and Y Y to say yes, and then enter for git ignore, and then uh, get status again. And so um, now now we will do git add dot git ignore git commit, and then, um, you know, want to ignore certain files and dirs. And now if we do the git log, we can see that, you know, we've got this commit in here that we just added. Um, another common directory that I ignore is that uh, if you remember from the, the Conda training a couple of weeks ago, um, I like to create my Conda environments in a directory called ENV inside my project directory. So that directory is, I typically make sure that I ignore that directory. Um, I always version control my Conda environment files or my configuration files, but I never version control the environment itself. I always ignore it. Um, th there's some uh, um, there's some other material in here um, on different more advanced features of the git ignore file um, but um, just a second um, but I don't think I'm going to go through it too much, to be honest. So I like what I've showed you here is basically how I I use it: ignore directories, um, ignore particular files. Um, there's you can use the um, not exclamation uh, or the not operator, which is this exclamation point. So this is a the only other thing I'll mention. So if you wanted to ignore all files that match that had extension dot dat except for a particular file, you could you could edit your git ignore file to look like this. So you have first you have this pattern. So ignore everything that matches dot dat, but not final dot dat, basically. So there's all, all kinds of stuff that you can do um, in your dot git ignore file. Um, 
in, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes when we get to the GitHub section, um, then when you create a new repository on GitHub, they have uh, a Git ignore file templates that you can use. So like if you're doing a Python project, you can just click to add a .git ignore for a Python project, and it will ignore all of the stuff that you would want to ignore for a Python project. And ignoring, so ignoring is just, um, um, it's just telling Git that you don't want to version control it. Because if you don't ignore it, then Git is always going to ask you, it's always going to tell you, hey, you've got all these untracked files in your directory. What do you want to do with them? Do you want to add these changes? Do you want to track the file? Or do you want to track the files? Do you want to add changes? What do you want to do? And if you're not going to version control them, you might as well add those pattern, those file names or directories to the git ignore file. So your git status output is, you know, nice and clean. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you will get a um, huge amount of cruft will accumulate in your untracked files, you know. This, this happens a lot with um, IBEX users here at Calst and Slurm files. So uh, if you are using version control on IBEX and you're launching a bunch of Slurm jobs, then Slurm creates two output files for every job you launch. And over time, you're going to accumulate all of these Slurm files. And if you don't add um patterns that ignore slurm.out or slurm.error to your git ignore file in your project on ibex you're going to have i don't know hundreds of untracked slurm files which you would for sure not want to track um so that's you know another use case for you calst uh calst folks okay um GitHub. Okay, so I forgot to remind you um, to create a GitHub account if you had not already done so over the break. So um, please create a GitHub account if you don't already have one. Um, if you want to participate in the hands-on portion of uh, the rest of the afternoon, if you're not bothered and you're just happy to kind of watch uh, watch me kind of demo it, then you don't have to create a GitHub account. Um, GitHub is a um, is has become kind of the place to share research, uh, share your source code, share your projects, and it's a great place to build a um, like a project portfolio or a work portfolio if you want to do work in data science and machine learning. Um, so I would encourage you to set up an account with GitHub um, if you don't have one. But um, all right, so that's that's done with the plug for uh, for github so uh in this uh, let me just see how much time we have left we got about an hour left and let me remind myself what we have left to cover okay so we will try to push through with remotes in github uh, collaborating and conflicts, and then probably not have time to discuss the open science licensing citation and hosting. And I'll leave that for you guys to read, um, read on your own time. Let's go back to remotes. Okay, so there have already been some questions about how to share changes with others. And so that's what this episode is going to be about how to share your changes with others. We're gonna talk about remote repositories, what they are and why they're useful. And we're going to learn two new, very important commands, push and pull. And push is gonna be used to push changes from our local repository to GitHub. And pull is going to be used to pull down changes um, from GitHub to our local repository. And even though this is going to focus on GitHub, so there are other um, um, cloud hosting uh, repositories 
um, Bitbucket and GitLab are two others. All the, the cloud, um, uh, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google all have their own cloud uh, specific GitHub um, or Git implementations uh, so that you can have remote repositories inside of the cloud. Um, uh, the cloud service providers infrastructure and not dependent on GitHub directly. Um, also, if you want to use Git and you want to have, but you don't want to share your research work just quite yet, um, and you're here at KAUST, so KAUST IT, Research Computing IT maintains a, um, an internal uh, GitLab hosting service works exactly the same. The Git works exactly the same. And you know there's some slightly different stuff between GitLab and GitHub. Um, but the basic concepts are the same. Um, but if you're interested in that, you can talk to, uh, you can send a, uh, a ticket to kind of IT help desk and someone will reach out and contact you to talk to you about the IT's uh, GitLab uh, hosting service for Calist users. They may also have some training um, online or um, they usually offer training on on some of these topics as well uh, during the semester. Okay, so uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to uh, create a repository on GitHub. So navigate yourself to GitHub and log in if you haven't already done so. And so this is my, uh, or this is the, the landing page for my um, IBEX training uh, GitHub account. And so I have a whole bunch of repositories over here. And many of these I've created in the process of making tutorials um, for uh, KAUST users for our YouTube channel. Um, and it looks like I still have this repository, which I created the last time I taught the, the Git course. So I need to delete this first. So to delete a repository, you would go to settings, scroll all the way down to the bottom to someplace called the danger zone. And then you will click on the delete this repository. And it will give you a warning that if you delete this repository, it's gone. But you should note that if you delete the repository on GitHub, if you have a local copy of it, that doesn't do anything to the local copy that, that you have on your laptop or workstation. You're just kind of erasing uh, this repository from GitHub servers. And then you click the button and you put your password and voila, done. Now, the reason I needed to delete that was because I wanted to show you how to create a new repository. So up in the top right-hand corner, you'll see this little plus um, uh, drop-down menu. So if you click on that, you can say new repository and new repository. So there's something called template repositories. Um, I have some training videos on our YouTube channel that talk about how to use some template repositories that I've created. Here, we don't have a template repository. We're creating one from scratch. Um, and you'll pick the owner of the repository. So this will just be your username and then we'll create a repository name and you can um, call it whatever you want. We're gonna call it planets. It has to be unique for your username. And then I will put um, example, uh, GitHub repo for fall 2021. Git workshop. And I'll make it a public repo. And now we're not going, because what I'm showing you how to do is link an existing local repository with a repository on GitHub. We are not going to add any of these files. We're going to create a completely empty repository that has nothing in it. Typically, if you're creating a brand new repository on GitHub, you would add some files, choose a license, things like this. And I'll show you uh, an example of that 
um, in a minute. But let's just go ahead and just check public. Don't check any of these. And then just say create repository. OK. Now, once you've created the repository, so now Git has created a pay or GitHub has created a repository underneath your user on their servers, and they give you some suggestions. Um, the first is how to create a new local repository from the command line and how to link it up with GitHub. So you'll recognize the git init command. We did that earlier. And they have this command to add a readme and then commit it. So first commit. And then to another way to switch your branch to main. Um, and then this git remote add origin. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And then git push origin main. But we already have um, an existing repository. So what we need to do is this second set. So we need to first copy this first command. OK, and paste it into our terminal. And what this is doing is it's creating a, it's using the git uh, remote add command to add a remote. So a remote is a repository that exists on some other server. It could be in the cloud on GitHub or in the cloud on GitLab or you know, on a server here in Calst, somewhere else. And it's going to be given a name. So every remote needs a name. So typically, you want to call the remote version of your local repository origin. That's just a convention. You don't have to do that, but I generally do. And then we get a URL. And the URL basically points to some server somewhere to a .git repository on that, uh, on that server. So we hit Enter. OK. And so that has added um, um, this remote. So we've now linked our local repository, which is running here inside of JupyterLab, with a re empty repository that we created on GitHub. Uh, let me just go back to check my teaching notes. OK, so when we did the, we created the new repo on GitHub, it was kind of like running these commands at the command line, but on GitHub servers. Um, and then that leaves us with two repositories. We've got our local, which has a bunch of work that we've already done, and then a blank version, which lives on GitHub. OK. Um, So now, if we wanted to look at, um, um, if we wanted to look at the remotes, we can do git remote dash v, and we can see that um, um, you can see that we have um, origin. And then we have the link that we just added. And you can have different, there's another git command called git fetch that we're not going to talk about, but you could have potentially different, um, different remotes for fetch versus different remotes for push. Um, but they're going to be the same. They're always the same in every case that I've ever done. OK. Um, and I'm going to see if we can get around uh, these, the having to deal with SSH keys um, because that's an added complexity. Uh, so let's see if we can do that. Um, so now that we have, Um, so now let's do git status. Okay. Now let's try to do uh, git push. So now we're going to use this git push to command because we want to push our git, the contents of our git repository from our local um, repo up to 
the cloud. Yeah. So we'll do git push, the name of the remote that we want to push to. Um, and the name of the branch that we want to push, which is main. Uh, okay, and so here, this is where you would add your uh, password. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute and remind myself what the password is. That's why I save my passwords in my browser. Um, Bear with me a moment while I sort this out. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so if you paste your password in um, and hit enter, you're gonna get an error message like this. And the reason is that since the last time I taught this course, GitHub has removed support for password authentication. So they did this in August of this year. And so you have to use your personal access token. And so this personal access token is something that's called an SSH key. So I will, um, I'm gonna walk you through the process of um, pushing again with SSH. I already have an SSH key, like a personal access token set up. So I'm gonna show you what it would look like to do it successfully. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, how to set up SSH keys. Um, yeah, that's going to take a bit more time than I would I had intended. Um, but okay. Um, okay. So what we need to do is. Um, there are two. Uh, links to GitHub repositories. So there's a connection via HTTPS or a connection via SSH. If you want to uh, push and pull via HTTPS, um, that is, you can't do that anymore. You have to use SSH instead. So if you click on SSH and we co and copy now this. So this is now uh, the URL that we want to use. And so if we go, and we do, uh, there is a git remote set URL origin. And now we're going to change it to use the SSH URL. And now, um, if we do git push. Um, origin main. And you say yes. Hmm. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh. Okay. Huh. Interesting.
Okay. Now, so this didn't work. Now, the reason that this didn't work is because um, SSH keys have two components. They have a public key and, uh, and a private key. And the public key that you create, you add to your GitHub profile. And so I have a public key for my IBEX training user that I've added to my GitHub profile. Then you have a private key which exists on your computer and that you never share with anybody. That private key, um, um, I have a private key for uh, the IBEX training user that lives on my computer, but I forgot that I'm not actually using my computer. I'm on a cloud instance um, that is running on the Binder Hub accounts. And so there is no, um, there is no private key that will match the public key that I have included in GitHub. So that is actually um, going to take some thought. So in the teaching, I have to take some thought on how to how best to handle this. So in the teaching notes, we will what we will need to do is we will need to create um, SSH keys. So if you've not done this before, this is a good opportunity to, to see and learn how to do this. And um, so let's just do it. This is a little bit, um, uh, this is a, a little bit, SSH keys are a are, are critical thing to understand because if you wanna log in remotely to any server, you need to understand SSH keys, whether you're logging into IBEX or whether you're logging into um, a remote server like um, AWS or on Google or Microsoft Azure or something, SSH keys come up again and again and again. So, you know, if you're logging into IBEX, then you might have a username and password that you can use. That's secure-ish, but not as secure as using SSH keys. If you want to log in remotely to cloud servers, then you're going to have to use SSH keys. So let's just see how to do it. So th this might eat up a good bit of our time that we have left to talk about Git, and I apologize for that. Um, but I do think it will be a useful learning opportunity. Um, so hopefully we'll get it up and running. OK. So the. As I, I mentioned earlier, so SSH uh, stands for Secure Shell Protocol. It uses a key pair. So there's a public key and a private key. Um, and this relates to uh, cryptography. And it's really interesting and super clever mathematics about how you generate these public and private key pairs. Um, but though you can think of um, the public key as being this lock, and then the private key is the actual key. And the public key or the lock is what you post on remote servers, whether it's a cloud server or a GitHub server or something. And then the private key you never share. That always stays on your, your local computer, um, laptop or workstation or whatever. Um, right. So what we're going to do is on a Linux host, there is always in your home directory, there is always um, a folder, a special folder called .ssh. And inside that folder is typically where you would have any SSH keys um, or, um, or things like that, if they existed. But when you look at the contents of of this folder, if it's empty, then nothing exists. You've not generated any, any keys. So um, the key pairs, if they were listed, would look something like this. There would be, they would have like a, a name, 
file name and the same file name dot pub. And the dot pub is what indicates the public key. The private keys always have, uh, are always just the file name itself. Okay. So let's generate some, um, let's generate some public private uh, key pairs. So there should be, I hope, So, oh, sorry, let me just clear this out. There is a program called SSH KeyGen, KeyGen, which as you might imagine from the name, generates SSH keys. Um, oh. Nope, I wanna do that, sorry. I wanted to look at just the, um, just the help menu. So what you can do with SSH key is they have all these different options in here. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to use a, uh, a particular algorithm for generating the, uh, the keys, which is um, well, it's ed25519, you don't need to worry about that. And then we are going to use the dash C option to add um, an email. And so I'll just add my, my email on the end. Uh, what was it? And hit enter. And then it will ask, you know, it says it's going to generate a public private pair using this algorithm. And then you say, you either type the path to the file that you want to save, or you just accept the default. So I'm just going to accept the default in this case. Um, so I will hit, um, actually, I'm not going to accept the default. And the reason that I'm not going to accept the default is that in practice, you will want to create, you, will, you don't want to use the same SSH key pairs for different things. So if you're creating one for GitHub, you should explicitly create a new one for GitHub and differentiate it from say a public private key pair that you would use for some other instance or some other application like logging into IMAX or something like that. Um, so what I will do is I will just do the same file name, but then I will put a GitHub at the end just to indicate that this is for GitHub. Uh, so that looks good. So I'll hit enter. So you can add a passphrase, which is like a password that will allow a program to unlock your private key. Um, you can choose to create a passphrase. I'm not going to create a passphrase in this case because we're using this throw this throwaway cloud instance um, that's just going to get deleted when I uh, at the end of this workshop. So I'm not going to bother with the passphrase. So I'll just hit enter and enter again. And then this, um, this uh, random art image has been created, which is just a random piece of art that corresponds to the, uh, the public key. Um, and we have created a key. And now if we look inside the special dot SSH folder, uh, we can see here is our public private key pair that we just created for GitHub. Okay. Now there's a command here uh, with SSH or SSH that you can use to check whether um, you can authenticate from your the computer that you're running on with the GitHub server. And so we can try git at github.com and you'll get permission denied. And that's because we've not added the public key to GitHub server. Okay, 
So how do we add the how do we add the public key? Well, what we need to do is we need to display the public key first. And displaying the public key is okay. The public key is is things we're going to share with other servers. So it's okay if you guys see my public key. The private key, we don't want to look at the private key. Um, so in the .ssh directory, now we can look at, so this would be my private key. I don't want to show you my private key because then I'd have to regenerate the key pair again. But if I, if I look at the public key, it looks like this. This is the public key here. And I can just copy that. So I can just highlight it and copy it. Um, and now I need to add it on GitHub. So I go back up to GitHub. And on your GitHub profile, there should be a settings option. So you click on settings. And then over here somewhere, there should be an SSH and GPG keys. And you can add a new SSH key. And I will call this uh, example public key. Um, and then I will paste the public key in there. And then I will click add SSH key. Okay. So now I have some other public keys. And then I've got this example public key, which I just added. All right, let's try this again. So now that I've added that public key, if I go back and try to authenticate again, hmm, I'm still getting uh, permission denied. Why is that? Hmm. hmm, this is strange. Let me just try to push. Hmm. You know, maybe it just take maybe it's just going to take a minute for that key to show up in let's go back here. <clears throat> Try again. Hmm, not quite sure. That could be it. Let's try. Let's see what my git config looks like. So my username is Ibex training and hmm. 
not quite sure why this isn't working because is there something wrong with my public key? Oh, I, th I think I, I think I might know the problem. Um, this Hmm. I am not sure what's going on here. And this is generally the right process. So, oh, I forgot to. There we go. Okay. So what happened? So the reason that this did the okay. So if you had accepted the default names for which is what the I should have followed the instructions here because it would have been a although maybe this is a good teaching moment um, for how to recover from a screw up like this, but here, the, if I had accepted the default, uh, where is it here? The default um, file names, then um, GitHub and or then SSH will will pick up the correct public private key and be able to make the connection. If I wanted to use a non-default file name, I need, there was another step with SSH that I needed to do, another option in the SSH command that I needed to pass in order to specify which key file I wanted to use. And that would have been yet another step. And I forgot that I was gonna have to do that. So I should never have gone down that road. Anyway, so it looks like we have connected successfully. So now I should be able to do git push Huzzah. And now, so this is what it looks like when you finally push something. Now note that setting up, creating these SSH key pairs and setting it up properly has to be done once and that's it. You don't have to do it every time you wanna push. Now that it's done, it's done. And then if we go back here and we refresh, and now we have our local GitHub repository has been pushed up to, uh, our local repository, Git repository has been pushed up to GitHub. And so there, there's questions of, you know, can I use this method to make an SH key inside of the terminal on AWS? So um, yes, yeah, so this is the, the general blueprint for um, creating SSH key pairs. Um, the the general again the general idea is you create the ssh key pair on whatever the local machine is 
and then you add the public key to whatever the remote machine is. Now, in many cloud instances, the local machine could be some cloud-based shell, like AWS. AWS has a command line um, uh, package that you can install on your local machine, and you would probably create SSH key pairs there, and then you could use that to authenticate with AWS. Or if you're logged into AWS and you're using like their version of a cloud shell, then you would create the SSH key pairs within that cloud shell. And then you could put the public keys typically then on some VM that you've created that you want to have running and, and connect to. But that's like, you know, well beyond the scope of the Git course. But yes, the general principle is the same, uh, Sahar. OK. Hmm. Well, that was a learning uh, learning moment for me too. Um, I did not realize that Git had completely disallowed pushing and pulling via HTTPS. Okay. Whew. All right, we managed to do that. Um, so that's good. So, and we have a few more minutes left. So let's let's keep plugging along then. So what did we do when we ran this um this git push command it pushed uh, to the origin remote the contents of the main branch and this dash u um, is passed the first time that you run the command and it set it basically creates a link between the remote branch called main and your local branch called main so what happened? Well, so this was our setup locally. And when we ran the git push command, it took this repo and pushed its contents here up to the remote. So any, if we had like local files uh, here, so did we have any local files? Um, okay, so no, we had, so we had this data directory, which we had ignored. We had this results directory, which we had ignored. So they did not show up here. We also had created this moons directory, but we didn't have anything in it. So there's also no moons, moons directory with files. It's only this Mars file that we've been working with today. Um, right, now the opposite way around, if, if there were changes on GitHub that you wanted to pull down to your local, um, repository, you would do git pull origin uh, main. And here there's nothing to pull because there, there's no changes. And so every it just says already up to date. Right, okay. Um, you can actually do like some simple development within GitHub. So if you wanted to, for example, so let's go uh, just to demonstrate the pull command. So I'm going to go onto my GitHub repo and I'm going to create a new file. And I will call this um, example GitHub change dot txt. And then, you know, this file is just a stub file to show how to pull changes from GitHub. And then down here, I will say, um, wanted to demo a non-trivial pull from GitHub. So this is my commit message that I'm writing here. And I want to commit directly to the main branch. And then I'll just commit new file. So now I've created this file to kind of, this is mimicking like a collaborator creating a new file and pushing their changes to the same GitHub repo, for example. So now I've got this file here. And what I wanna do is get pull origin main. And now I've pulled down this new file. And if I run the 
ls-l command, you can see that here's that new file that was just created or that we created on GitHub and then pulled down from GitHub. Whew. Okay. Um, one other thing that I want to do is, so there's some exercises here. What I want to show you now is um, an example of creating a brand new, pro a brand new repo directly on GitHub and then um, pulling that down to um, cloning it and pulling it down to your local workstation. So if we were to do this, um, we would go up to the little plus icon again, and we'll do new repository. And then I will call it um, GitHub example fall 2021. And brand, I'll just give it an example, brand new repo created on GitHub. Okay, I'm gonna make it a public repository. I'm going to go ahead and add a readme file, which is just going to create um, main as the default branch. And it's going to add just a blank readme file that has not much in it. Um, now I'm gonna click add a git ignore file. And now I get to choose a git ignore template. So here, generally because I do Python projects, I will select Python, um, but if you see, you know, there are loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of, of git ignore template files kind of for any particular language you might want. So I'm just gonna pick Python and now I'm gonna choose a license. Um, it, it's very important if you are going to share your code on GitHub, you need to add a license file. The license file does a number of things. Um, it first and foremost, it explains what people can and can't do with your code. So that's the number one thing that a license does. Um, the second is that it will actually increase the amount of people who re who will reuse your code because if someone comes across a repo that doesn't have a license, most of the time they're not going to use that code because there's no clear like rules and regulations for how they can use it. And if they use code that you know, is unlicensed, it could cause problems later. So most people tend to not use code that's not explicitly licensed. So typically you wanna share code because you do actually want other people to use it. So it's always good to put a license. Um, choosing a license, uh, there is a, um, there's an episode in, um, in these lecture notes on things to think about when choosing a license. Um, a very popular license within the Python community is the BSD3 clause license. So I'll just choose that one. Um, this allow, BSD3 clause allows for um, uh, reuse of the code, attribution, it allows for both commercial and non-commercial use. It allows people to take the, um, the code and wrap it up into a closed source proprietary application and release it for commercial gain. Um, Python typically uses quite permissive open source licenses um, like BSD3 clause. Um, but attribution is, is a key thing here. Like they have to attribute the code to you and copyright to you and things like this. So now we'll click create repository. Okay, so now we have this new repository that we created that has you know these files in it, and we would like to get that down to our um, our computer. So we go over to code, and we click get clone, and we select SSH, and then we click this uh, link or this button here, which copies our. Um, our link to our GitHub repo. And then we go back. And now I'm going to change out of the planets directory. Let me just clear this out. And into our introduction to Git directory. And now I'm going to use the clone command, git clone. And then I just paste the, uh, the link and hit enter. And this is going to, again, use my uh, SSH key pairs to Securely authenticate to GitHub servers 
and um, copy down the repository. And so now I have this GitHub example fall 2021. And if I change into that and run LS, you'll see I have license and the readme. And if I run dash AL, I'll see that I also have the git ignore file. Okay, so that's an example of how you would create a, um, a brand new project on GitHub um, and then bring it down. So if you want to clone a repository that isn't yours, so that's a good example. So, so let's do that. Um, so cloning a repository that isn't mine. Uh, GitHub.com, uh, PyTorch, let's see what comes up. Okay, so here's the official PyTorch repository. Let's suppose that we wanted to clone this. So, we're, so we can come over here to code and we can do a clone and we can select SSH copy. And then we'll go back and we'll do, I'm gonna change back into the introduction to Git and then we'll just do Git clone. So it's the same process, Sarah. It doesn't matter whether the um, whether the repository is yours or not. So generally, if you can find a a, a pub when you create a public repository on GitHub, that allows uh, read access to anybody. And most, I mean, any, anything that you find on GitHub will be a public repository, and you will have read access to it. So you can always clone. Uh, any repository from GitHub, whether you own it or not. Um, I'll see how long this takes. So obviously PyTorch is a huge project, so I, I don't know how long it's going to take to clone this repo, but if it, if it looks like it's going to go on for ages and ages, I'll just cancel it. Okay. Um, let me stop sharing for a minute and see what else we can, we can cover. Sorry, I'm just going to pause the recording for just a minute. All right, and we're back. Okay. Um, let me share my screen again. So we have only about 15 minutes left. So I, <laughs> I hope you found that diversion into SSH key pair, key public private key pairs um, interesting and instruct and useful. Um, unfortunately, it means that we're not going to be able to cover the rest of this, the section on GitHub. Um, I'll have to make some substantial changes in future versions of this course so I can get through that SSH section uh, much more quickly um, or perhaps cover SSH key generation in the bash training. Um, so that we don't have to spend time here covering it, um, something like that. But th this uh, episode on collaborating um, kind of walks you through the process of, of how you might collaborate with, um, with people via GitHub. And um, the basic idea is that uh, you can you know, add collaborators to a shared GitHub repository, um, and have, have everybody push and pull from the same repository. Um, or um, you can have your version of the repository on GitHub and you can ask um, other people to what's called fork the repository. Forking a repository, so here's an example. Um, up here, if you wanna, instead of cloning this repository directly, I could fork the repository and this would create a copy of the repository, but under my GitHub name. So for example, let's pick another one. Um, 
uh, a TensorFlow, for example. Uh, well, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so TensorFlow. So I could fork the TensorFlow repository. And this would create a copy of that repository, but underneath, you know, my user. Or if this was another user, um, they could create a copy of my repository. And then they could make changes to their own repository and ask if I wanted to um, accept those changes. So for example, if I was going to try to contribute to TensorFlow, as the IBEX training user, I would fork TensorFlow like I've done here. Then I would uh, clone TensorFlow. And then after I have a local copy of TensorFlow, then I would make changes and do whatever I wanted on on TensorFlow, and then I would push those changes up to my version of TensorFlow, and then I would use GitHub to ask the original TensorFlow repo whether they wanted to accept my changes or not. And then there would be a process by which that would be adjudicated, something like this. So those are a couple of different ways that you can collaborate on GitHub. And I know I didn't have time to go through here, the different details and things like that, unfortunately. Um, sorry about that. But again, hopefully you learned how to make SSH uh, keys. Okay. And yeah, so there's not, uh, conflicts was the other one that I had hoped to, to touch on a little bit. Right. Um, Okay, so I think what I would like to do at this point. Um, okay, so there's a question. Can I clone just one file within a repo instead of the whole thing? Um, no, so you don't. Um, so the short answer is no. Um, if there is one file from a repo that you want to that you want to use, you have to be um, you have to be you have to be a bit uh, careful in that if you when you clone the whole repo you're pulling down the repo together with a license file and everything like that if you just pick one individual file out of a repo you've got to be careful to note yourself like where the file came from and um and you know what the license was and you know who has the copyright on it but you can't just go into and copy a file and then um, reuse it without attributing it to where it came from. Um, typically what I do, if, I, if there's some file in a GitHub repo that I think is interesting or useful, like I will um, generally not copy paste, but will rather try to understand like what it's doing and then modify it to my own needs and then make a little note about, you know, put a little comment in my code that, you know, this came from, and then copy paste the link from the GitHub repo file into my script itself. So like, I got this idea from this particular location. And then that at least provides some reference to like where it came from. Um, but yeah, generally you don't just clone a single file. Are there any other questions? Yeah, uh, David. So, yes. <clears throat> when it comes to Git, can you? So far, we've only seen examples with the text files. Yes. Can it be used for other file types, pictures, or uh, of the sort? So yes. Um, okay. Right. So any. So it can be used for any flat. Uh, any flat text files. It can be used for pictures. Um, you generally don't want to store large amount, like really large files on GitHub. So there is something called GitHub large file storage, which helps manage some of the difficulties of version control when you have really large files. But typically like your data files, if they're really large, 
like more than a few hundred megabytes, you wouldn't want to version control them. Um, you'd want to come up with some other solution. Um, but it will work for pictures. I have, you know, um, I generally, I, well, not so much anymore since I came to Calc, but I used to make GitHub repos for all of my talks that I would give, and I would use the GitHub repos to create the slide deck. And I would store images and movies and things like that that I wanted to show um, as part of my slides if they weren't available somewhere else online that I could just link to in the slides. Um, I would put those on GitHub and that works fine. But uh, what about locally on a machine? I mean, if, if I were to version control, let's say pictures or some other data files, <clears throat> does Git just save all the files in one batches or does it only save, you know, uh, changes from one file to another? Uh, um, so generally, um, um, sorry, hold that thought for a second. There's uh, someone is dropping off a package. Sorry, very important package. In addition to my uh, computing teaching and things, I also really, really like to fish. And I just got a new fly fishing rod in the mail. So I'm very excited about this. Um, right, but your question was not about fly fishing. It was about um, um, version controlling locally um, things like images or, or data files. Um, right, so even locally, so I don't um, I don't version control large files even locally on my computer, um, and particular like large data files that if I have large input if I have large input data files, um, I won't version control them because they're generally not going to change. So there's kind of no point. If I have lots of intermediate data files that change when I rerun scripts and things, I prefer to just version control the scripts and then regenerate the intermediate inputs as I need them um, rather than try to version control them in that sense. Um, so pictures, the only time I like version control pictures are again, like if it's locally, I mean, I probably wouldn't do it locally. It would, the only time I version control pictures or even version control small data files is if I'm using, if I want to push them up to GitHub because I'm going to use them to teach a course or I'm going to use them to give a presentation and I need to be able to access them via the internet from anywhere and not just like my laptop or something like that. So then I'll push everything up. Um, like for example, if, um, um, in the introduction to data science workshop, you know, last week we did Python. So if you look in the Python, so there's a whole bunch of CSV files here. Now these are small CSV files and normally I wouldn't version control them, but I did anyway in this case because I needed to push them to GitHub so that everybody could use them as part of the Binder Hub uh, cloud computing instances. So that's an example of, of how, when you might want to version control some small data files for like a, a, a teaching or a um, sharing a basic example or something like that um, with others. And let me see if I have any other. Um, so, ah, so at one point I had a slide deck that went along with this course. And so here in, the assets for that, I have some version controlled PNG files, which were referenced as part of the slide deck. So those are, you know, you can version control these files if you wanted. Um, so yeah, so you can do it, but the, the, the important thing to remember is don't version control large files. 
it will cause you load a headache uh, or loads of problems. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming today. Sorry about the technical difficulties with the SSH keys. Uh, I'll have to uh, make some changes to how I teach this course in the future, but hopefully you learned something about generating SSH keys. Um, and there will be a link to a feedback, um, feedback form and a link to today's training will come out tomorrow. Um, it'll be posted on YouTube. And um, so look out for that. Um, and you know, feedback is very welcome. So you know, please do pass along any feedback or requests for additional training. We can uh, uh, potentially consider it going forward. And um, other than that, thank you very much for your time. Next week is the last uh, Introduction to Data Science workshop series uh, this semester, and it will cover SQL. Um, so we'll learn how to use structured query language, SQL, for extracting data from uh, databases. So that will be next week's uh, topic. So thank you very much, and I'll see you next week.